the, in the warm-up, uh, I mentioned already, um, I was attending a class with uh, Luke on designing innovation games. It was, I think, over a year ago now. And uh, during this class, um, we had to come up with our own idea for an innovation game. And since I do a lot of this impact mapping, I started to wonder whether some of the collaborations uh, we do around impact maps might benefit from using an innovation game. So I tried it out, of course, I miserably failed uh, during the class doing that. Um, but the idea kept growing on me and I, uh, I met Goiko, I think a week after or so, and he was very enthusiastic continuing on that and, and basically... He was enthusiastic about everything. Yeah, exactly. So he pushed it through and actually we arrived after several things that we tried out with two games that we think are, might be useful. Um, and that's what we want to go to present to you today. Uh, we want to quickly give you an introduction what impact maps are. Who, who has worked with impact maps already? So a few people have already. Um, Still, we want to introduce the idea of it, because otherwise it doesn't make much sense to talk about certain collaborations around it. But then we want to talk about the challenges uh, that are usually arising when you're working with impact maps. Uh, three particular ones, and we also want to present two games that should help you overcome these challenges. So that's the plan for the next 45 minutes. Yeah, and kind of, I guess one of the interesting things that came out the of the last time when we did this presentation, I think the games that Christian came up with are useful even if you have no plan to ever use impact mapping. If you want to kind of use any other technique to drive by goals and things like that, these things should still be useful. Um, so, kind of the, the, the thing that's really popular at the moment in the Agile community is the whole scaling thing. We've heard how you know it's less safe and whatever that and who knows what else. And uh, whenever people talk about scaling, uh, it seems that we're trying to scale uh, how much money we tend to spend. And how many people we have and kind of the whole thing about scaling is basically what's the rate of how much we're, we're burning cash. And um, one of the really interesting um, stories for me that came out recently was on the register. The register is a kind of relatively popular UK tech news site. And they were talking about a particular project called My BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, where kind of they've spent about 75 million pounds without anybody noticing that they have no plan to deliver anything interest, important and they went under the radar because it was agile and kind of the conclusion of Andrew Olowski was that kind of the whole thing went completely unnoticed because it was agile and they could make up the benefits as they went along and <clears throat> that's kind of the type of scaling agile that really really scares me um, a couple of years ago, I was working with a, or I wasn't working, I had a meeting with um, a senior director of a Swiss bank where they wanted to adopt Agile and they were trying to kind of um, hire a consultancy to help them, whatever. And uh, I was in this completely bizarre meeting where uh, instead of just saying, oh, we're going to do this, or we're going to do that, I tried to get those people to think about what they actually want to achieve. Instead of being agile for agile's sake, what, what they want to get out of that. And the guy on the opposite side of the table said, well, you know, we did 35 million change last year. Uh, this year we want to do 70 million of change. I said, oh, you know, that's a nice measurable, you know, you, you, Joachim talked about objectives and key results, there's an objective, you know, there's some key results there. And then I asked absolutely the stupidest question in my consulting career. <laughs> I, said, well, I said, what do you mean by change? <laughs> and I've put a senior director of a bank in a position where he couldn't answer. And um, they were throwing this number around where you know, nobody really knew what it was. A couple of hours later and lots of phone calls later, we agreed that that salary is an operational cost. That's how much in virtual money the rest of the bank was paying him to kind of deliver software. So um, basically what they wanted to do is increase their cost from 
35 to 70 million. And I said, I have a solution for you. Pay me 35 million, I walk away now. It's a win-win situation, you can say when I try. My wife is going to be ecstatic and everybody, you know, you don't have to change anything. It's kind of, you, you've done what you want. So, that, that's kind of the big problem that impact mapping is trying to solve. Impact mapping is trying to attack this kind of, you know, let's just make up the, the things as we go along. Um, so, we don't end up in the situation where we've spent all this money and pff, kind of, that, that's, you know, we've not really achieved anything important. Um, so, one thing that kind of tends to happen when people have this kind of, oh no, let's do this, let's do that, is they end up in a situation where everything is a good idea. And the fact that a product owner said, I want this button here, immediately means that a team has to go and develop it, or it's on the backlog, and very, very few teams I've worked with have any way of saying whether something is actually a good idea or not. It's kind of whatever shiny thing we're trying to chase. And uh, there's a really interesting data point from a paper called uh, Online Experimentation at Microsoft by a guy, guy called Ron Kohavi, who went back to all the PowerPoints that launched grand initiatives and measured whether these things actually, after delivery, achieved what they were supposed to achieve. And his conclusion at Microsoft was that about one-third of initiatives moves the, moved the numbers in the right direction. About one-third did not produce any statistically relevant change. And about one-third actually damaged the numbers they were supposed to improve. And um, this is where uh, these things happen, not because somebody is stupid or somebody doesn't know how to do their work, it's because those things were bad ideas, or those things were good ideas at the time when they were planned, but by the time they were implemented, stuff changed in the market. So, um, the problem with not having a kind of big vision and what we want to achieve on a higher level is that we might end up kind of hiring lots of people to just do stuff, and two-thirds of that stuff might just be bad ideas, or are very likely to be bad ideas. In the paper, Kohavi also quotes, um, uh, data from Amazon, and he says that kind of Amazon has a, f a success rate slightly below 50%, which means that um, if you look at it kind of from a pessimistic perspective, half of the ideas that they push into the development process are bad. On the other side, you can look at it from an optimistic perspective that kind of almost half of their ideas actually turn out to be good, which is compared to everybody else amazing. So. From, from that perspective, um, being able to spot what's going in a good direction, what's not going in a good direction is really, really important, especially kind of preventing people from chasing these shiny new things all the time and not actually delivering anything important by the time we spend millions and millions and millions. So, um, that, that's kind of part of the problem that comes from iterative delivery um, and the other part of the problem that comes from iterative delivery is kind of the underpants problem <laughs> so progress reporting like uh, the underpants gnomes so who has who knows South Park okay anyone saw the episode with the underpants gnomes a few people saw it it's a famous episode not only for software development as Jeff Patton brought that idea into the realm of software development. If you Google the internet for uh, underpants gnomes, you will find them in different contexts. Um, <laughs> to start off with, so in this South Park episode, suddenly the underpants gnomes uh, show up and they start stealing the underwear of the people uh, in, during night and everyone gets confused, everyone gets excited. Half of the episode they are chasing the gnomes to find out where, where they are taking their underwear and when they always almost ran out of underwear already they finally catch them in their secret then on a pile of underwear and say ah now we got you so what are you doing why are you collecting our underwear and they say yeah we are very good in collecting underwear you see you have a lot of it yeah but why are you collecting this underwear we're very good in that but why well, uh, you have, we don't know, we ha you have to ask our business gnome next door, he will tell you why. So they go next door to 
to the business gnome and they and he presents them the business plan. Yeah, we have a business plan. <laughs> Phase one, collect underpants. Did you notice we are very good in collecting underpants? Yeah, yeah, we saw that, but what's next? Well, then there is phase two, and then there is phase three, profit. <laughs> yeah, okay, hold on, hold on. What was phase two again? Well, phase one is collecting underpants. It's very important, phase one. Underpants collecting, we are very good in that. Yeah, we saw that, but what's phase three? Then there is phase two, and then there is phase three, profit. Sounds familiar? Uh, exactly this is the problem that we often see when we're working in software. We're very good in collecting underpants. We're very good in delivering stories, features. We are optimizing our teams on that. And somewhere there is somebody who is expecting a phase three profit, but we don't know what should happen in between. So impact mapping is actually trying to to deal with that problem and not just focus on how many under, underpants you're collecting. It tries to somehow make a connection between how this is going to be useful and what has to happen in phase two in between. Okay? So an impact map usually has three levels. On the top level is what, I, what, what we call business goals, success indicators. Uh, in your game stocks it were the bets. Basically things uh, business things that it's worth investing in where they are not sure whether this will turn out to be true or not but they want to invest into that and they want to see whether this is a good idea or not and whether this will work. On the lower part of the map are the underpants. So this is where somebody comes up with many ideas or options how, what would be useful, what would help in order to bring in these success indicators. And Phase two is something exactly in between. And in between are usually always humans who behave in a certain way. This can be organizations, this can be people in organizations that can be your customers, competitors, it can be your own people, uh, your own employees. But in order that something changes in the world, something that makes your bet work or not work, people have to change their behavior or have to do something differently than they do now. And you are hoping that with whatever you deliver down there, this up there will happen or you want to find out whether it's not happening. And actually this is the middle layer that you're trying to close the gap with on an impact map. You try to figure out why do you think or how do you think a certain bet will turn to be true? What is your assumption? What is your belief in, in what should happen? What is the hypothesis that you want to either falsify or see that this, that this actually seems to be working? And, and, and this is what you are basically modeling in the middle part. This is the phase two. Now, that, that's, that's the first step actually doing that exercise. Usually if somebody comes with an idea, here and probably even is able to tell you the goal, it's usually a very good thing to find out what should happen in between. Why do you think this idea should, uh, should help you with that goal? And uncovering what is the actual thought in everybody's head. And it's also interesting to do this with different people because often in an the organization there are several ideas how a certain thing you are going to build will bring benefits on an organization level and there are different opinions on that and you can of course discuss that nobody knows but only uncovering it and finding it out in the first place and seeing clearly who thinks about what in what way is already very beneficial however that's just the first step in the next step we are trying to to actually acknowledge the fact that we don't know what will happen so we have some assumptions, we might want to discuss about who is right or not, but ultimately the best thing to do is trying it out because we, we cannot predict it. So there is no way to analyze it. As, if, you, if you can analyze it and safely say this is what is going to happen, you don't have a complex problem, you have just had a complicated problem that somebody had to figure out and then you do it and it will be done. But most of the times, since you have humans which are self-driven, self-autonomously uh, thinking, you will not be able to predict it. So what we're trying to do is we try to put on measures on each of these levels that help us to observe whether what we assume will happen is actually happening. 
So, of course, we have some kind of indicators on a business level whether what we think means success, what does it mean to win the bet, what does that mean? And we also break it down to the smaller behavior changes that we probably can uh, observe earlier. So, in order that, for example, some turnover number gets bigger, people first need to start buying something or need to do something differently and these behavior changes can be observed earlier and can be validated earlier so that if you see that something was probably not such a good idea you can stop doing that and try something else instead of delivering everything you thought is needed in order to achieve a certain goal and that also will lead to that you will be able to slice smaller ideas, so first steps towards something that you want to change, where you can make an earlier feedback loop and actually see whether something you thought is a good idea actually proves to be a good idea before you invest more into it. So what this boils down to is that, that we, we build up these uh, hierarchical hypothesis chains and try to understand what people are trying to achieve, and we attach our backlog to it. Now, if you look to your backlog or things that you want to do, the, the consequence of this is it not only contains things that you want to build, stories, or probably even at some point you will specify it down to acceptance criteria and really small details what you're actually building, your backlog also should contain the high-level assumptions that you want to validate, which are the behavior changes, business changes, or goals, that you hope to achieve. And like you are probably defining some tests for your lower level things that you build, some unit tests, some acceptance tests, you should also define tests to validate whether the changes, the impacts on a behavior change level or on a business level are actually that are telling you whether this happens or not. So you have to write tests for business and actually describe what means success for you as a business, what means behavior change in terms of behavior change on, on, on individual stakeholders that are influencing your goal. That's the basic idea of, of an impact map and Volk is going to show you a concrete example. So um, the, the thing that Christian just mentioned, kind of figuring out how do, we, how do we measure this thing from a business perspective, how do we test it from a business perspective, is something that is very often missing from lots of organizations. where we are, lots and lots of people I know measure whether they have done what they planned to do, but they never measure whether that was actually a good idea. So, testing stuff from a business perspective becomes interesting. Now, the big problem with uh, iterative delivery and the more we reduce delivery phases is that stuff that we end up doing kind of here very often do not move these big numbers so much that we can say, well, this was a good idea or not. If we're looking at things like profit and market share, they come on a delayed cycle. I'm not going to do a small 20 minutes piece of work, release that and then wait five months to figure out whether that increased profit or not. That's stupid. At the same time, in order to know whether this is going in the right direction or not, we need to be able to figure out is this a good idea or not? And that's kind of one of those big conundrums that we have with short iterative deliveries. There's a, um, a huge problem how people measure whether they're kind of doing well or not. Especially with Scrum, I think lots and lots of teams tend to use burn up and burn down charts and story points as their measurement of progress overall. And that's really interesting because from a perspective of what Christian mentioned earlier, all those things measure how many underpants we've collected. <laughs> so the next time you kind of go and say, well, you know, this week we've done 40 story points, just imagine yourself holding 40 dirty underpants and kind of <laughs> other people's underwear, and that's basically what you're doing there. Um, so th there's another really great um, uh, article, or you can read online and point your kind of colleagues online to and it's called why FBI cannot build a case management system. It's a really great story how FBI in, in the US tried to build a case management system using waterfall and then they spent something like 90 million dollars and decided it's not going okay and then they wanted to do it iteratively 
and then they spent another $360 million iteratively and decided they're just going to can the whole thing because they can't build it. And as they were building this stuff iteratively, uh, they had this, uh, they, were, they were scared after the first two years of delivery and having this kind of figuring out at the end it didn't work. So they wanted to do it iteratively and get progress reporting iteratively. And every two months or so, they had this steering meeting where the development organization presented a thermometer of red, yellow, green, and how the project was doing. And it was always kind of green, slightly towards yellow. It was always going okay, always going okay, until the point where it wasn't and everything exploded. And the key conclusion after the whole thing was that they were blinded by purely measuring activity. They were measuring whether, kind of, okay, we planned to deliver this many functional points, we delivered. Or we planned to deliver five stories, we delivered four, and things like that. And that completely blinded them to understanding whether they're actually going in the right direction or not. So, um, from a perspective kind of that we have here, we, we know that it, in order to do iterative delivery, we have to have relatively small changes we want to roll out to production and things like that, but we also need something else to measure there. And that's where kind of measuring for business change comes in. And an impact map puts all this information into a kind of visual diagram. It's just kind of spin this around. You get a business goal that's in the middle of a map where that's kind of something we want to achieve as an organization over the next six months, nine months, a milestone. And that's something that we are unlikely to be able to kind of affect by with a single user story, a single change. That's a longer cycle. Then we have kind of a set of actors, stakeholders, personas whose behavior needs to change in order for this thing to happen. That has nothing to do with software solutions. That's kind of changes to the business. Then we have how their behavior is going to change. And then underneath that, we have a set of deliverables, uh, user stories, features, technical tasks. We want to do epics, kind of that might affect or might, you know, we, we have a reasonable idea that, that they're going to affect this change. So what this allows us to do is kind of visualize a whole hierarchy of assumptions where if I create a chat system, people will stay longer. And if they stay longer, we will be able to grow mobile advertising. Um, the interesting aspect of this is this thing here. Those are kind of the impacts of people. That's why it's called an impact map. Where in most organizations, there will be a PowerPoint with something like this. There will be Jira with something like this. And then there's magic in between. <laughs> and an impact map is kind of trying to visualize that magic and make it explicit so people can actually figure out what they're doing and measure that and, and not get blinded by measuring activity. So, um, I mean, maybe a good example was in the keynote from Luke when he was talking about better pavements will make a safer neighborhood. So actually, yeah, you better know, pavements. better pavements would be a deliverable. Safe but there was, there was a, an assumption that the crime rate uh, would, would go down. And that was actually what convinced somebody else on their table to, to vote for the better pavements because they discussed the outcome of that and not just the actual thing that they want to deliver. So the, 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 really, the really interesting thing is kind of this stuff here because we should be able to measure or observe changes to people's behavior on a shorter time scale. If I do this and people stay for longer, that's already good, I know it's going okay. If I do this and nobody stays longer, then probably something else is missing there. We either need to implement a few more features or we need to change the way we are measured, you know, change the way we are approaching this, so maybe it's just a bad idea. So, um, looking for behavior changes uh, is a good way of answering the underpants nose question and measuring something more than just activity, which is what is kind of really, really important. So an impact map is just a kind of very simple visualization of these things and it kind of is interesting because it's collaborative, it's visual and it's fast. It's not revolutionary in any particular way, it's just kind of visualizing information people should have anyway and making it accessible to everybody, making it transparent. 
So we can then go and measure this as we're doing and we can have a good conversation about what we plan to do and start prioritizing kind of hierarchically down from the goals. And there's a couple of kind of really important things about this visualization. The first is that it explicitly divides our sphere of influence from our zone of control. If I decide to implement chat systems, I will do that. I mean, there's some technical risk of that, but most likely if we decide to implement a feature, that will happen. Now, if we decide that people should stay longer, well, you know, that might or might not happen. I, other things might happen there, some competitors, some changes in the market, or some other things. So this allows us to kind of explicitly figure out whether this thing was a good idea or not. It allows us to visualize our hypotheses, assumptions. For people doing anything like Lean Startup, this is a really good way of kind of connecting the business goals with what we plan to deliver. The other thing that kind of is really important about this is that it explicitly helps us uh, kind of present options and then figure out which of these options are good ideas or not. The, the purpose of an impact map is to visualize lots of different <coughs> options so that we can have a good conversation around what, which of these options are good ideas, how do we figure out what's good, what's bad, and in the design thinking book, Change by Design, Tim Brown talks about uh, what most companies get wrong with business analysis. And this is business analysis, not software business analysis, kind of business business analysis. And he says that most companies do business analysis badly the way that they use business analysis to go into the details of an option that the stakeholder has already selected. And they say that by that point, if you've selected the wrong option, game over. It doesn't matter how well you go into the details. And his kind of idea is that the true purpose of business analysis is kind of here, to be able to select among multiple options to figure out which of these are good. An impact map kind of just visualizes a ton of these things and allows us to have a conversation about them and to say, well, I believe in this, I believe in that. Like Luke said, you know, you present lots of options to people, you get them to actually figure out what's good, what's bad, and support them in being creative. The other thing an impact map does really, really well is it helps people focus on achieving an objective. And my experience is that whenever we start doing this, people come up with much better, simpler, easier solutions for what you actually want to achieve. Like once we define that the center of the goal is growing mobile advertising, people will come up with a ton of other ideas that might be kind of faster to deliver or things like that from the originally proposed solution. But then we can measure what's actually going in the right direction, what's not going in the right direction. Um, one trivial example of this is I worked, I, I, I'm building this mind mapping tool and a couple of years ago our milestone was to double the number of active users. And as we were developing this, we kind of ended up in a situation where an angry customer email led us to understand that because there was a checkbox we needed to configure to allow university admins to install it to all the students, and we didn't check that. Um, we kind of ended up saying, well, you know, this checkbox, once we've checked it, has kind of delivered more active users to us than all the features we've delivered over the last three months. And we've actually achieved the goal of doubling the users so we can stop this thing now. We don't have to kind of pollute our software with lots of stupid stories. And kind of the, the key thing for me, in, um, Ronko Harvey's data that two-thirds of ideas at Microsoft are bad ideas, is kind of, let, let's imagine that most people here are not an order of magnitude better than that. It's kind of, uh, you know, Microsoft is not that bad at delivering software, they're kind of have reasonably successful products. It's, let's assume that somewhere between 30 and 50 percent is a reasonable benchmark for lots of everybody else. That means that slightly more than half of the software you've put in over the last year is just a bad idea. It failed from a business perspective. Now, have you taken that out? Have you deleted that code? How many people actually go and delete the code from the system after it was proven to be a bad idea. And if not, why not? I mean, why, why are you paying for maintenance? Why are you paying for storage of that source code? Why are you doubling your cost of testing and maintenance to maintain bad ideas? 
And kind of that's a really, really interesting question to start asking because if we can start kind of spotting these things and understanding when we have achieved the goal, when we no longer have to complicate the software with features or what features we can take out, we can immediately reduce the cost of maintenance, the cost of testing, the cost of deployment by half. You immediately have twice as many developers, effectively. So, kind of, this is, these are all kind of good ideas about impact mapping, but um, impact mapping suffers from a problem where it's kind of a trivially simple visualization. It's not particularly clever, it's not particularly revolutionary, it's just a way to visualize things. And lots of people kind of end up following the template and missing a couple of kind of important tricks and not really getting the value out of that. I think our industry in general is kind of plagued with people following templates and not kind of achieving what they want. This kind of, Joachim said, you know, I'm doing Spotify model but not really and things like that. Or, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that. And I found a brilliant example of that outside of our industry when I was flying in. This is kind of the menu from the plane I flew in. Um, I kind of, this is from, you know, I'm from Serbia, so this is Air Serbia. And it's absolutely amazing. I think somebody kind of told them um, that they need to start serving vegetarian dishes on the planes as well. And kind of, this is the uh, main course menu. Try and spot which one is vegetarian here. You get, you get chicken and beef in either case, kind of, you know, because of course, you know, why, why on earth would you not have chicken and beef? I assume chicken is the salad there, really. And kind of my, my guess is kind of this is the, you know, this one is just chicken and beef, this one is chicken and beef and some vegetables, so it's kind of, that's probably the vegetarian one. <laughs> so, kind of, it's, it's relatively easy to follow a template and get it completely wrong. And that's what kind of lots of people end up doing. So, kind of, um, one of the first really, really big problems that I keep seeing with impact maps is because it's so easy to think about features, impact maps tend to get overloaded with stuff inside our zone of control. Because it's much, much easier to think about things we can deliver than kind of how we're going to deliver. So, phase one is much, much easier to think about than phase two and phase three. And phase three typically comes pre-packaged in a PowerPoint. So kind of all these things get overloaded and kind of typically what I see is, oh, there's kind of some business goal over there. There's, you know, one or two kind of things in between. And then it's <laughs> seven trillion user stories we want to do. And at this point, kind of people are just justifying their existing backlog of 500 ideas without really trying to figure out what's going to happen, how it's going to happen. And that's a really, really huge problem if we're trying to measure any serious impact because effectively the, an impact map like this skips the most important part. It skips answering kind of problem number two. So, I mean, the impact map is also very good for consolidating experiments and there's only a number of experiments you can keep track of at the same time, which is another reason why you don't want to have too much in your zone of control. If you attended the morning session, I talked about complex and complicated. So once you know something is a good idea and you want to do more of it, it became a complicated problem. You need to analyze it. Then there are other visualizations that are better for understanding how to solve that complicated problem where you know already that that's a good idea to do. The impact map is helping you to solve the complex part, figuring out whether something is a good idea at all or how long you want to follow a certain idea and when you want to stop doing it. And that's why this is a problem if you have too much in here as well. The second problem is, uh, and this is often the root cause for the first problem, that people are not thinking hard enough about what kind of, who will change their behavior, who needs to change their behavior, what will happen in, in this phase two, and, and they come up with very generic actors, like the users. And if you have a very generic actor like a user, it's very hard to think about what kind of behavior changes will ha need to happen in order that your idea gets validated and, and that actually what you think will become true becomes true. So that's a typical trap people fall into, uh, and which often then also leads to this um, uh, to, to that you don't have any idea what kind of behavior changes are happening if you think about too generically about actors. And this is where all the methods come in of personas, 
but it's not only limited to the primary users. It's also uh, 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 you also have to think about off-stage actors, people or organizations who can influence you, who can hinder you achieving your goals. So it's a real important. It's really important to think holistically about who will influence your goal, and that that's that's the big thing that you should think about, not only your users. The third problem is uh, uh, we, call, we used to call sticky behaviors. Uh, we now came up with a better term, which is unchanging behaviors. And that's like something carved in stone. So if you, if you have finally the people or, or, or basically the roles that will, stakeholders that will influence your goal, then people will usually not describe how they will change their behavior through a feature, but what what they will do when using that feature. So you you will they will not think about the behavior change, but about what they are doing already when they use that feature. So like uh, somebody um, uh, buys something um, is not a behavior change. A behavior change would be somebody buys something faster, so decides quicker to buy something or buys more of something. See the difference? One is I buy something, that's a behavior, it's not a behavior change. Behavior change is how do you buy differently, faster, more, or ultimately you can say somebody didn't do that at all so far, they start buying. Okay, that's fair, you can say that, you stop doing something, but often it's more subtle than just saying somebody starts to do something or stops doing something, it's more like somebody does something differently. And, and that's what we call the unchanging behaviors problem. To cope with all these problems, we came up with the two games we're going to show you in six minutes. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be very quick games. Yeah, it's a quick game. So, Boyko starts with the first game. So, uh, is Chris, is it kind of the, well, what, what part of the problem is if people describe kind of behaviors and, and they have generic actors, then there's nothing really to measure because there's no change in that behavior. And, and the critical thing is we want to describe an impact, we don't want to describe kind of just all oh, buying and things like that, like that. So the first game we came up with is called the Revenue Stream Map, and it's a metaphorical game. Um, with metaphorical games, um, you try to give people something that they know as a metaphor, and get them to be more creative about something that you want them to discover. So, the revenue stream map starts with the idea that kind of people will more or less know where the revenue is coming from, and we use that to stimulate them to come up with lots of different actors, lots of different groups who can kind of contribute or obstruct a particular initiative. And in the revenue stream map, the idea is that kind of you have a metaphor of a city that requires fresh water to thrive or to grow. And the city represents your organization, your initiative, your project, something that you want to kind of advance or your product. And then there's kind of a bunch of rivers that are bringing fresh water into the city. And this is where kind of in the first phase people will typically try to just break down the different revenue streams. That's again something you already know. And then they try to identify sources of these revenue streams. And for each of these kind of small breakdowns, we want to figure out where, where does that river come from. And those are the stakeholders, those are the actors, those are kind of people who can contribute to this project or to this initiative. We also try to identify two different types of potential obstructors. One of the key problems with identifying actors is people focus too much just on the positive side of things. They don't discover who can obstruct them or who they need to monitor. And um, the kind of, there's two types of obstructions here. The first one is where the factory is directly polluting the water. Those are direct competitors, those are people who are directly blocking something. We might want to monitor or influence their behavior in some other, in a way to kind of unblock that. The other group of people are kind of, um, not directly damaging you now, but if they decide to compete with you or if they decide to block you, they could. This is kind of where Joachim you mentioned earlier, when they started, Google and Apple were their competitors, although they were not directly competing with them yet. And we, we want to see all those people there and get people kind of to um, think about identifying those groups. So this game is played with kind of the first part of the game is 
you start with an empty sheet, then you draw a city in a small group, people try to kind of identify revenue streams for a while, and then we give them these cards, and um, by the way, this game is open source, you can get all the artwork from GitHub, we'll give you a link later. We give them the cards to identify the sources, and then we give them the cards to identify all these factories, and get it, that gets people really creative to come up with lots and lots of different stakeholders that might contribute or obstruct the kind of initiative. And um, this game is really good because it helps people identify, diff get, kind of solve the problem that Christian was talking about around generic actors. Because we get to identify this kind of hierarchical breakdown of really, really detailed roles that people want to influence. Yeah, so the, just to clarify, the goal is not to identify primarily new revenue streams. You assume that you know already the revenue streams and you visualize them. The goal are basically the siblings here, so the factories and the sources, giving you a list of actors solving this problem of generic actors. The second game, uh, well actually this is the flow of the game, uh, which Goiko explained yeah. already. Uh, the second game should tackle the problem of these unchanging behaviors. Now we have all the list of actors from the first games, of both obstructing actors and contributing actors. Now we want people to focus really on behavior changes. And what we came up with there is a card game, it's not a metaphorical game, it's a card game, where after having collected all these ideas about actors that obstruct and support them, they should now brainstorm how their behavior has to change or can change to obstruct or help their goal, which will be then the middle part of the impact map, where they will I find ideas about how to actually support this or, 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 or prevent this. And the, the, we have come up with different templates for that. One is where you actually have to phrase what they will do instead of what they did before so that they really focus on the behavior change. So not buy, but buy more or buy something differently or like uh, you solve something on your own instead of calling somebody else for that. So really focusing on the outcome of something. Um, and this is nothing to do with software. This is yeah. kind of... So this is really understanding how your problem. system will influence the whole system. Uh, another template, so we have experimenting, have been experimenting with different templates to really get the people thinking about uh, the behavior change or what they do differently. So that would be basically the, the example that you do something faster, uh, something less or more in a, to a certain degree. People collect all these cards, uh, brainstorm it, and then they play some kind of poke around where they are basically uh, focusing on a certain actor group where they have collected cards and then they start to present each other what kind of ideas they came up with uh, and every time somebody uh, uh, sets down a new idea the others validate that this is really a behavior change and that this is somehow at least possible and then the next one comes and the last one who, who puts down a card has won the stack and are, the goal is to win the stack in the end so the idea is that what, this will ha what will happen in this game is usually that people will inspire each other and get into some kind of competition to come up with new ideas of coming up with behavior changes. So, so the idea is to gamify the, the, the process of coming up with new ideas, how the behavior of a certain actor or stakeholder group will change. And that's basically uh, the second game, and I think we have to close now. Okay, so uh, you can get all the artworks for the games from kind of this GitHub repository. And um, kind of as the, the critical thing here is help people identify who are their stakeholders, users, who can influence, and how do we measure whether this is a good idea or not. So that, that those two facilitation techniques that get people to be more creative about it, I think are useful even if you're never going to do impact mapping in your life. But if you do decide to kind of do these techniques, they will help you create better impact maps as well. And that's kind of the, the idea with the games. So, um, yeah, we're kind of running out of time. So this is the URL, you know, fork, uh, contribute, complain. It's all open source. Um, you know, provide feedback, say, oh, you know, we tried, it didn't work, and then we can improve this. Thank you very much.